Hello, I'm John Roberts and welcome to IFC in Conversation, where we talk to designers uh, in the built environment about what inspires them and their life and career. And today I'm delighted to welcome Catherine Ramsden as my guest. Catherine is founding director at Useful Studio, which is a London-based social enterprise of architects, designers and practitioners working closely with clients and collaborators to design useful, beautiful and sustainable practices. Sorry, practices, places. I'm getting your website wrong. Um, <laughs> Projects have ranged across the education, workspace, residential and master planning sectors with refurbishment and repurposing and reimagining at the heart. Useful Studio is part of the Useful Simple Trust, um, which is a family of professional design practices driving change and Catherine is its deputy chair. So Catherine, where did this all start? And was there a particular experience in your childhood that nudged you towards being fascinated with the built environment? Uh, hi, thank you for the introduction, John. I mean, it's probably good to start right at the beginning. Uh, and then I, my, I suppose I've got engineers in the family and that my father, I didn't follow his path, but he was a, a propulsion jet engine engineer. Uh, but there was a lot of experimentation, building your own house, uh, and a lot of tinkering as I grew up. But it was the, I was reflecting on what really, um, I think was a sort of pivotal moment for me. And it was, I did a careers class when I was, I suppose it's the equivalent of year nine in, in the States where we went to a steel fabrication factory. Uh, and it was this, I couldn't, I felt more excitement in that factory than I had in any kind of visit to a corporate environment in an office. And I think it's the sense of making uh, and that legacy of, of childhood of tinkering that I thought I've got to, um, got to get into that sort of industry, which enables you to have that level of ability to change things. That's, that's it. That's interesting. I, I was the same. Where I've got a, a moment with hi, with hydraulics, where I can remember, which I've never really done since. But just thinking, gosh, that's great. Now, in the last I have seen conversation, I was talking to Avery Bang, and she, like you, took two different university degrees. Coincidentally, one of them at Boulder, Colorado. So that's just we ought to go and get some a sponsorship from them, I suppose. What first attracted you to study environmental design, and then how did it morph into masters of architecture? So, I mean, Boulder is quite a unique place in that it, it still is, but it was even then, and that they were quite aware of environmental issues in the town planning and in the townscape of the, of the, of the city center. They adopted pedestrian streets at quite an early age. They had a green belt around the town. So the community is that way minded, and I knew it, and I was familiar with it from visiting. But the university, what attracted me about the design school, and at that time, there were only two places, I think, that you could do a degree in environmental design, which was at Boulder and at Berkeley in California. And it was intentionally not um, fixed on any one discipline within the built environment. So we had periods in landscape studios, we had planning, we had urban design, we covered architecture, and, and there were very strong links with the school and physics and engineering. So it was purposely, multidisciplinary and collaborative in its character and I think because I wasn't sure where I wanted to go in in this interest of tinkering I thought let's do that in an environment of people that are like-minded um, and that are investigating solar and, and all these different ways of living more closely with nature you know it's they were sort of doing this ages ago because uh, that's what it was uh, and it you know that decision ends up having such a massive um, influence on where you go and, and, and what you do with your career but the other thing I did while at Boulder was I spent a year in Copenhagen and also again big influence in terms of there's the sort of social intent in their housing and in their schools um, and the sort of very careful uh, way that they design with connections with nature, influenced by people like Saarinen and Alto. Um, so that was the first degree. And then shall I go on to why the second degree was, yeah. So I then <laughs> went out and worked for four years and I sort of lived this multidisciplinary um, experience through my work. And I joined an organization called Wallace, Wallace Roberts and Todd, which was actually founded by Ian McCarg, who wrote Design with Nature. And we then in California did a lot of work in landscape design, questions around linking trans alternative forms of transport with, with community design and, and uh, residential development. Um, and, and while I enjoyed that enormously, I felt that I wanted to build things, you know, maybe houses, buildings, and, and get a bit closer to 
the actual hands-on building and, and less of the strategic. So at that point, I thought I'm going to go back and do a master's of architecture. And at this point felt the confidence to be more specific about which portion of this, um, of these different disciplines that I wanted to go for at that point. So you were working in Southern California and it's a place I've lived and it's a, you know, it's a lovely place to live. Uh, and also, as you say, there was a lot of, through a number of phases, you know, um, there's been there's been some fascinating projects there and some great thought and there's a great climate to do environmental design in. How come you ended up throwing yourself over into the beautiful weather that we have in London? Well, maybe the, the three years in Philadelphia was a bit of a transition. So I, I always say, you know, I started on the West Coast and I sort of went further and further east. So first east to Pennsylvania, which is where I did my master's. And it was there, there were, there were links with that, that, that university and Wallace Robertson Todd, which is partly why I ended up there. But, and it was linked to the, uh, the rest of the Ivy League. So you, do, uh, you tap into this amazing network of, of um, institutions, which are very well connected globally. And I was introduced um, to the British firms. And I guess it was then a sort of high tech uh, and so all this background of, of hipster environmental design school and multi-dis, I got quite interested in, in those that were doing the high tech. So Grimshaw, Rogers, Fosters, and in particular Fosters because of their, I guess they had close parallels with the way they worked with engineers. They had this amazing coverage around the world and they were clearly pioneering. Uh, and so I got you know, onto a bit of a mission really during my time at Penn that I was going to get a job with Foster's. And, and I did go across, applied, misfired on the first attempt and that there wasn't a job. I think I, I hit 1995 was not a positive year in the UK for work. So I went back to the States for a period of time and, and then was able to return in 96 and got that job and landed right into the, the competition for the Millennium Bridge. That's quite, that's quite a project to to, to, to land for and, it, and, and it's interesting because I've been doing a lot of work with Foster and Partners but I was heading to Southern California and you're now coming <laughs> over in the other, di other direction. Now I'm aware of the fact that you know, in, as you say at that stage Foster's uh, were, they, they, they still are, but you know had this reputation as one of the, one of the, the, the big you know the, the, the big high-tech uh, companies uh, and, and there was a lot of people going there for, for experience and I was always impressed by their design process. Yeah. Over 10 years there, what were the key things you learned, both good and bad, without rubbing anybody up the wrong way, but actually, so, so, what, so, what, so in 10 years, what do you gain from being in a place like Foster's? I mean, look, I, well, I joined, I was lucky. I think I was exceptionally lucky because I joined, not that it's not great to work there now, but I joined when it was quite small. So it was about 130 uh, people and the Millennium Bridge competition and experience of building meant that I could work very closely with Norman and Ken Shuttleworth and Jack, Sir Jack Zuntz was on the team, Sir Anthony Caro, you know, it was this incredible group of individuals. And, and I guess the small element at that point, relatively small, meant that you were exposed to a lot. You, it was quite a tough environment, I should say. There's an enormous amount of rigor and expectation in this expression that you sink or swim. But that means that, you know, you can, you really, get loaded up with a lot of responsibility. And if you can cope with it and you can thrive, you, you know, you've got access to more and more projects and more and more choice. And, and I, the rigor was something that I, you know, it stays with you forever. That, that there, then there's never, you never give up. We used to talk about it as optioneering, but you know, it's never too late to ask yourself, have I done everything that I possibly can to make this the best possible project? And, and it could be super nerve wracking to have someone sweep in and, and sort of bin the scheme at the last minute. But you, you know, you don't take it personally and you think actually you're right, it could still be better. You know, chuck it all away and let's hit the decks again and, and take what we've learned and, and make it better. And, and I think that stayed with me and that it's, you know, you just can always continue to push and push and, and apply the rigor continue innovating, continue questioning things, you know, the, regula the regulations are there, but are they quite right? And, and can we find a build a case to question them or interpret them in a different way? And, and that's, those are great. It's a great, it's been a great toolkit, I suppose, you know, of, of skills that I've taken from there and massively grateful for that experience and, and a huge amount of respect for that organization because it's really quite something what they managed to do and continue to do. 
you, you, you made me smile there with the other story about optioneering because <laughs> you just brought back that feeling of oh no they've changed they've yeah. changed the scheme again <laughs> I still think on, on the right stag we should have built dome number 170 and not carried on past that <laughs> That was my favourite. <laughs> it was actually a drum. Um, so anyway, um, well, I slightly digressed there. Um, uh, a, a lot of the projects that you were doing at Foster's seem to be around education, housing and bridges. And those are themes that clearly continue to resonate for you today. What is it about them that, that you find important and fascinating? So I think that this is when it, everything you realize is all sort of tied together and that what you do when you're young has such an influence on where you go. And you, you're always making choices at every fork in the road and every decision and path you take. But I have always felt a really strong sense of responsibility, you know, to what, what is the purpose of our work and how can it have more of an impact than, you know, we're, we might be delivering against a particular brief or function, but there's always something more that happens, you know, as the product of a, often things that you don't even realize will happen. It's kind of serendipity in the unknown of a ripple effect of having designed something and what its impact is. And, and what some particular projects obviously have more uh, purpose, maybe they've got more localism, maybe they're, they're able to reach more people. Uh, and the Millennium Bridge was amazing because it did link, you know, the North and the South side in this way, the first bridge in a hundred years. That, and at that time, you know, people weren't really going to the South side as much as they do now. And, and the thought of getting those communities joined up with something which was in effect free, it's there, you know, every day open all the time after its pioneering um, early days of, of uh, closure. But, you know, it, it's a sense of, gosh, we've created something where we, no one could have foreseen the impact of what that, that connection creates. And, and then and in a way, education and housing, they have a kind of social drive behind them. You know, especially when you're doing state schools, which is what we were doing with the academies at Foster's and the housing that I did was affordable housing with the Peabody Trust. And they all had um, this element of, yes, the pioneering and the rigor and the design precision and the, the whole tech machine of Foster's behind them. But this really quite grassroots um, on the ground local community impact. And, and I you know, I was able to choose and, and find those projects within that organization and and have the impact that I wanted. I was building the whole time I was there that many people don't uh, always manage to do um, and, and all in the UK. And they became, of course, hugely influential in what I chose to, to build the business around in Useful Studio. Of course, the experience is key, but it's, it's the purpose behind those projects, which is really important. Yeah. Given this is IABSI and there's a lot of people involved in IABSI, not, well, not, I won't say completely not me, but there's a lot of people who do bridges you know, I have to see, I, I'm going to have to dig deeper, otherwise I'll probably get slung out. Um, but it's been interesting. Millennium Bridge, you've talked a little bit already, already in Chiswick Park Footbridge, which is, you know, it comes out of the expedition, useful, simple, stable. Um, the role of the architect versus the role of the engineer. Where does one start? Where does one stop? And given your background, where urban planning? It used to all be engineers. But maybe we maybe we ended up with it. Maybe there's a reason that we now have architects involved. What do you think? I mean, I think I kind of I really wish that there weren't titles in the room, and that I think you the best experiences have been when we've just left the title at the door, and that you're all in there, all with an equal desire to get the project to be singing on all fronts in the most cohesive fashion. And, I, and there's something about bridges where there's a real rigor in, in being minimal, I think, and that you can't afford really when you're soaring over, maybe with a very long span, to have a load of extra loaded stuff on there. So you've got to, there's an exercise of pairing back uh, that means you've got to do that in a collaborative way, I think. You know, you can't, one person can't take the bit off that actually has value to, to another piece of the pie. Uh, you, so you've got to come at it in a collective way. And, and I think it encourages um, the sort of communal approach. And the Millennium Bridge was hugely that. I mean, we all went on to you know, be friends and, and be connected in the industry for many years afterward, because you have this kind of shared experience of doing something for a community or a city in a highly collaborative way. You usually have very strong links with the, con the contractors uh, and, and like we did with Severfield and with Momberg Torsen on the Millennium Bridge and um, 
it's it's that uh, it's fairly streamlined, and and uh, both in the team and in the product. So yes, no no titles. I think everyone has. Of course, they come with different skills, but you know you have sculptors like we did with the Millennium Bridge, and you 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 unite around a common purpose. And and how how important do you think bridges are in terms of? I think you've touched on it already, already with, and it's interesting having talked to bridges and the bridges to prosperity in the last one of these, because um, they haven't is a completely linear pro, um, process between generating income for the people who are linked on the far side. But you talked already about uh, joining North and South London and and the regeneration that's caused caused yeah. there, but also there's a symbolic piece. Can engineers achieve that on their own or do they just end up dump, dumping something ugly in the middle of a, a town? You know, is, is there, is there some, is there something wider that engine, that architects are better placed to realize the sort of symbolism, the symbolism that a, a, a project like a bridge can, you know, because a, a good, a good, a, a, a bad bridge is just a bridge, whereas a good bridge can be seen so much more as we've seen over the last few years. That was a very, very bad put question, but I hope you see what I'm getting at. <laughs> So I think it's it's around responsibility, and I and I think this is something which I it's quite nice to see happening. I think, and that we as designers, you've got a real sort of gift to to make a difference and and enable change or you know solve a problem, and it, and it takes an awareness and a realization that you have that gift, um, and that you're with every decision that you make, it has an outcome. And it, and, and it shouldn't matter if you're an engineer or an architect, you should look at the situation in front of you and, and recognize that you carry um, quite a lot of power in your decision making. And that one decision could make a situation much worse. It could attract a lot more carbon, a lot more weight, a lot more time, a lot more money. Or you could think, all right, I could actually be, I could make a decision which will make everything better. And something that we've tried to do in a project which followed on from Chiswick Bridge in Meridian Water was we thought, actually, how do we design a piece of infrastructure which enables jobs? So don't just design something which is made out of a material which has no affiliation with this community or it's made, it relies on skills that aren't local. Designs use design as an enabler to provide jobs, especially in infrastructure, because it has a long time generally, you know, there's here's a moment of I'm not designing for 30 years, I'm designing for 120. So it's going to be a really significant landmark in a place. However, modest and tiny the linkage might be, it's there usually for a long time. So can I provide jobs for local people through, you know, designing this in a way which taps into a local skill? And in that case, it was carpentry. So we did a very low tech, modest kit of parts of timber pieces like an, along an assembly line, which could be fabricated into a bridge, thereby providing a job because these kits could be generated by these locals and then further people could be upskilled during the process because it wasn't super uh, high tech or removed from what was possible. But, but so not only have we provided jobs for those that exist already, we provided the potential for upskilling, but we've also invited a sense of ownership in the community. And then they thought, actually, I built that, you know, I contributed to that. And that's what's so beautiful about the Bridges to Prosperity and that they build it with the locals. And then it's with them as their, you know, what they, you know, their sense of, it becomes at the heart of the community. And, and I think anyone can establish that awareness, but it comes down to, making people feel the responsibility of being a designer, instilling that in education. So don't focus only on the maths or the, or the problem solving, but think about, of course, we're designing for humanity or biodiversity or the earth uh, and, and always think of that. And that's where behavioral um, change is important or you know, behavioral precision at the outset, you know, establishing this understanding is, is key. How, how do you bake those into the project throughout its life? Because it's interesting. I'm just thinking about a few, a few, a few, a few things I've been doing recently through with the construction process. Whereas quite often, you know, you're, you're supporting a slab or trying to do away with props or something. But then somebody will make a break because they'll see, I have to build a bridge. I have to build a building. They'll make a pragmatic decision, which then undermines all the other agendas that are going, going on. How, how do you keep all those 
you know, you could say they were at, you know, maybe in the past we've said they are value add, but actually what you're saying is they are much more part of the project. Alongside building a bridge, you're also building building the uh, the social infrastructure that's capable of building a bridge. How do you keep those things important? I think it's it's that it's you always have to strike a balance, I guess, and you have to understand that you won't achieve everything that you set out to. I think optimism is really important, uh, and I think persistence is really important, and and I think that recognition that. If you haven't done everything, that's okay, and that a small step is is a step forward. Uh, and then, you know, evidence is the best way to make things move forward. So if you can just weave in a couple little elements throughout that process, and they don't attract cost, and they actually make everything better, you can show that as evidence to the next gang. And, and I think that that's what's happening. You know, there's enough of a cycle of evidence out there, both good and bad. That people are making better decisions, you know, and you can see the the, the sort of investment in the public realm and invest in, investment in awareness of social impact and, and purpose. And, and everyone is saying, I must do this, I must do this. But it's not just because it's an extra layer or a box to tick, but because it's actually rewarding. It might be financially rewarding. They might market the units more quickly. It's, of course, because money talks. Uh, but sometimes you, you know, you're, you're more successful. You enable planning, they have a smoother ride, the development progresses, and, and everyone's happy. So there are benefits. It's, it's, um, it's an all-rounder. It is something that people, if I, if I think back compared to 10 years ago, people talking about these things and achieving these things a lot more than they used to, which is, which is great. Yeah, it's, it's a great moment, I think. Yeah, it's... Um... So in a moment, let's talk about useful, simple and useful studio. But actually, we were talking before before we pressed press record. You, there, was, there was a journey to get to get you out of the big the, the, the big thing. Yeah. That, that, that we were saying beast in a positive word at Foster's. So when you're now all things useful. To, <laughs> um, I, I'm interested in this partly because I'm, I've been going through it myself. And so I'm always interested to hear other people's versions of it. How did you get? That easy journey from A to B, what letters did you go by? So I think it's, this is when perseverance and courage are also needed because it's not easy. You know, when you work for large organizations, there is a real, you have all this asset around you of things and amazing people and, you know, the most amazing equipment and, and support that you can tap into. And you, are, you become quite accustomed to operating as a sort of machine with lots of elements feeding in at different times and you sort of orchestrate this machine from the beginning of a project to the end and suddenly you find yourself without any of those tools and you either have to reach out to friends or other consultants and assemble it in a different way or you have to find a way to exist without it or you have to do it yourself uh, and and it, it's not quick it's not a quick transition and you you it, I think it says a lot about, you sort of learn a lot about yourself and you think, okay, am, am, am I even capable of doing this without that, that big machine behind me that I've become so, so used to? And I think it's, it's tough, it's difficult. Um, there's no doubt. Uh, and especially later on in your career, because you think, have I gone backwards, you know, without all of these things behind me? But you, you get alongside that a real sense of, um, ah, how fantastic, you know, I can now, choose a path entirely of my own making. Um, and I can assemble the, the, the team of all the people that I think are best for this particular project. And then they can go away and dissipate and you can build another team. And that, that it becomes richer and uh, more interesting off the back of it, but it does require that independence. And I wouldn't say it's quick. You know, I had a couple of false starts of thinking maybe this is the right thing to do and, and that wasn't. And you have to sort of reset and, and think, OK, I'm going to try another thing. Um, and you seek out and you talk to people and you accept that these forks in the road are quite important. I mean, change is good, I think. And, and I and I always felt that I mustn't, you know, I mustn't. I, I didn't want to stay at Foster's for the duration because it, it is an amazing experience. And I learned what I did, but I wanted to build on that. And, and so you, you sort of set these milestones in your life uh, and you, if you can stick to them, ex accepting that they might not be straightforward, but you, you always grow, I think, off the back of change. Yes, it's interesting. It's quite, it's quite scary. It's quite scary at times and probably, <laughs> probably uh, 
in some ways, I, I, could, I, I couldn't have. Um, I have great admiration for people who set fit themselves up on their own when they're younger. That really is it. That really is agreeing out of the plane without the parachute and making it on the way down. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting process. So okay, there was a there was a in doing the research for this B Core, which is a new phrase for me. Useful Studio is a B Core, which is a social enterprise and an employee owned organization. Now I can understand all the words in individually. <laughs> when you put them all together, what exactly is it? And also, we've talked a little bit about it already. Why? So this started with, uh, and it's, this is a really good question, and this is, it says a lot about what, where I think business um, and uh, you know, us in the industry need to go and whether capitalism or whatever, however we progress and get ourselves out of our current situation, I think it's, these are really important parts of it and that business should operate as business for good really, which is our kind of, um, I think that's the sort of motto of the B Corp. But, but the journey, so the Useful Simple Trust was formed and it grew out of Expedition Engineering in 2008. And there they had a decision, this is before I had any affiliation with the organization, but they, they were mindful of succession expedition. And they were also thinking, actually, hang on a minute, we don't wanna just do structural engineering. We're interested in all these other things and how, what sort of business setup or framework would enable us to kind of broaden out you know, how can we be more than expedition? So at that time, it was Chris Wise and Ed McCann and Sean Walsh drew up this massive um, trust deed, which is, it's, it's employee owned, but it's actually an employee benefit trust. So nobody owns it and everybody benefits. And they had this expression of naked in and naked out and that you didn't have to buy to get in. You weren't bought out when you left. It was quite, they wanted it to be quite fluid. Um, they wanted to be able to have a kind of umbrella of comfort around multiple areas of interest. So could this, this umbrella organization or trust uh, enable us to research or invest in, in um, socially uh, minded uh, ventures or in fact harbor startups? So that's where the studio grew. So I benefited from that model of business and that I joined initially to work on a bridge but then I thought, hang on a minute, I could probably build an architectural practice within this umbrella, which would be quite interesting and additive and also benefit from all these engineers and kind of expand on this idea of a multidisciplinary business. And they'd already attracted Thomas Matthews, who were communication and graphics. It was already quite an interesting bag of, of, of skills, but all with the same intent. You know, I should say the one thing that is a common characteristic of everyone in the trust is this real sort of sense of purpose. You know, how can we have an impact always in what we're doing? How can we do good? Um, and, and, you know, how can we innovate? Everyone is a bit sort of, and it's not an easy um, uh, mix, but the, with those sorts of characters and that kind of drive and this, you know, degree of different disciplines. But uh, it, it is this common thing. I think you all want to have the same, you all have the same interest really that, that unite us and you can always fall back on that because it's such a strong thing that unites you. It's not around commercial success, although we should probably be more minded on that if we were clever. We're getting better, which is good. Uh, so the studio grew within that uh, and we, we latched on to the Employee Benefit Trust. But what I then took on is a mantle because I've been sitting on the board of that organization for six years now. And I, I thought, right, let's, let's be a bit more uh, organized in terms of uh, measuring our impact. What have we done? What impact and benefit has it created? And maybe apply some metrics. Uh, and we discovered that we'd been operating as a social enterprise from the get go without of seeking out that certification so that was very easy we you know we just sort of went there we showed them our transparent um, model of business and governance and they said you already are a social enterprise so here you are with your certificate and that that enabled us to access to this massive network of really like-minded individuals doing lots of good through their business and we became much more sophisticated and mature about our impact and, and our, our you know, influence on society through design projects. Although I should say almost no social enterprises are design disciplines. So we were quite unusual, but we thought there's no reason why we don't use our projects as a vehicle to do good. But the thing about social enterprises is that it's very geared towards social impact in, in, in communities and in people, but less so on the environmental side. 
So we, I, I know about B Corp because it's, it stems from the States. Um, it's actually started in Stanford in California and in Boulder, I think has more B Corps than anywhere else in the world. So I suppose it's in my, in my makeup, but they were getting more and more prominent in the UK. And I think the UK is now the second largest holder in the world of B Corps in terms of countries behind the States. So there's been a massive growth in the UK, which is really exciting. But I thought, let's, let's align ourselves with B Corp because they have some very sophisticated tools which everyone can access. One is called the um, B Impact Assessment, which you can go on through the B Corp website and you can start to measure yourself in terms of uh, impact through governance, community, environment and client or customer. I think those four key themes and there are loads of questions and you can begin to record how well you're doing and also set goals to become better. Uh, and they also have a tool around the SDGs, which, which complements the, the impact assessment. So you can begin to think about yourselves around the common language of the sustainable development goals, which is also very helpful, not only in terms of internal organizational understanding and messaging and awareness and, and getting everyone to speak the same language uh, as, a, as a business, but also to think about using your projects as a vehicle for doing good. And then speaking to others, the network of the B Corp and also our clients, you know, explaining what it is that we do, why, and just what value it has. So you can say, this is what I've done in terms of carbon. This is what I've done in reduction of carbon, I should say, uh, obviously. Uh, you know, what have I done to, to help um, young people get into jobs? What have I done for, for education or, or all the all this stuff that the this trust has always done around um, research? And innovation. You know, there's been a lot of research projects around how to, you know, make a bean much lighter than it is when you just buy it off the shelf. And, and those all tap into this. Um, so yes, that's why. Yeah. yeah no, some of some of the research papers are very interesting. Again, done. I've talked to a lot of the people involved in getting it right. Uh, and yes. uh, yeah, that uh, it, there, there's there's some really really important things going on and it's been great to see how you guys have been been driving some of that you, you touched already on money which is a kind of it's interesting there's a lot of people who get involved in the in in in, in design and social goods to a certain extent there's a fit that sometimes there's a feeling it's a bit of a dirty subject but at the same time i find it interesting having gone through like you know arab originally you know which which he gave the company away and had a sort of first version of the john lewis version in, in some yeah. way in terms of their constitution of the way it's it's owned by the employees uh, but then going to Atkins, which is a public listed company and being impressed how sharp they were with money, not in a bad way, but the fact to a certain extent being, you know, being owned by shareholders drove, drove a certain discipline around money. Then going to, to a prop, then I went to a private company, which again, actually drives decisions around an individual can be in the room deciding what the definition of value is. Yeah. So I can see, yeah, because, you know, Whilst you don't want to get too focused on money, perhaps not having it's not a good thing. <laughs> um, how do you get that balance right? So it's super important, obviously. And, and by sitting on the board, I've kind of been deep into right at the front end of a lot of decision making about, you know, how much money have we got and where do we put it and why, how do we make more? Because it's sometimes people confuse a social enterprise with a charity and it's absolutely not you know we are a business we have to remain profit profitable otherwise we won't survive and and profit is uh, you use you you're right I mean I think people are a little bit hesitant to talk about it because it means that they all they care about is money but it's actually a vehicle you know profit enables and and gives you the ability to do more and it's really hugely important that that we are profitable and so much so that we've we've got now something which is a bit of a, a you know a push in the trust called profit with purpose so you you know you you must focus and and be mindful of the value of being profitable and and then think about it gives you this ability to, to then do what you want with it. Do we give it back to ourselves? Yes, in, in the form of profits, uh, sorry, bonuses and good years. And, and do we invest it in other things? Yes, so we've got the useful giving, which is a little group within the trust, which think about what we do with our money. Here's the pots and, and how do we distribute it and what, what who and what benefits in any one year. Um, but I, I actually sought out a mentor um, when I joined the, 
the board uh, a few years ago who was really in the world of, uh, they actually work for Jupiter, so big um, financial asset managers. And, and their observation was, you know, you've got so much purpose around doing good, but do you have the same level of commercial purpose? Uh, and it was clear that we had to, we had to keep both horses going at the same time, you know, because if you don't, you're not sustainable. And ultimately that, then you can't continue to operate and do the good that you set out to. So it's, it's seeing it not as a negative, but as a positive and something to celebrate, because I don't think we would celebrate enough the projects which made profits. You know, it's like, oh, isn't that beautiful? Or haven't you done something lovely? Uh, but, you know, what about the person who just made a bucket load of money because they ran it really well? They were super efficient. They were very rigorous. They might have saved the client money in the delivery. And that's something to, to celebrate. So we're, it's that's something that we've had to work on and be more mindful about. Because uh, I get it, I totally do. It's massively important. I, yeah, it may, again, you're making me smile there because you remind me of one organisation where the line used to be: you didn't actually get made director until you made a big enough loss. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, yeah, um, but no, very important. Uh, similarly, the important subject. You talk very passionately about diversity and the value that it brings into business and and industry, and uh, and just around the single issue of, uh, of women in construction things have evolved painfully slowly during my career. There has been progress. It's not a done deal yet. Why do we need to focus on wider diversity and, uh, and what are the practical steps that do you think are needed? I mean, the why I think is really easy because, it, but it's helped by evidence that's being gathered more recently about the benefits of having diversity in the boardroom and that better decisions, more balanced decisions are made. But I think it's like, anything if you've got too much of the same thing i think you you don't realize that you might go a bit um static or you know you've lost your dynamism you're not being challenged enough and diversity just means different things you know there are different types of people in the room that have different experiences and they that means that you will always be challenged and and being dynamic continuing to change and always being challenged and welcoming challenge are hugely important. You know, we're not going to progress without recognition that change is good. We talked about change, but that's what diversity brings. And, and I think if people begin to value it for those reasons, it's, it's a no brainer in terms of good business decision making uh, and, and profitable businesses, good governance, you know, successful uh, leadership will will always be better off the back of that variety is good and um dangerous to to not engage in it i think it's risky behavior to not pursue diversity but the the thing about it is that it does and this is where we really we have to be very mindful of it because i think it's something about human nature you you tend to sort of default to things that are familiar and it takes uh you know a mindful thing ah oh, i must you know, welcome that diversity because it's good for the situation that I'm in, any whatever tiny situation, whether it's a child in school or or a business making a massive decision around a merger, you know, I've got to, I've got, you've got to sort of welcome it, invite it in and, and if it's not there naturally, seek it out so that, it, you know, the board, let's say a board is, is, does benefit from that challenging and that diversity and if it's not there, you should invite it in and that's something that we've done, you know, we've, try to always keep at least a 50% uh, balance of females on the board. Uh, our chair at the moment is a female, Judith Sykes, and there's, you know, there are a number of female directors and we've actually got a non-exec who comes in to sort of probe away at the commercial thing in particular and about, you know, are we being, are we up to speed on our policies and are we being responsible and not getting too lost in the, in the purpose-driven side of things. So you've got to, you've got to, look at it, understand it, accept that you might need a bit of training to be more mindful so you don't fall into the unconscious um, uh, sort of safety trap of, of common uh, or familiar decision-making. Uh, and all the while knowing that it's, it's um, a no-brainer. Yeah, it's, it, it, and especially since how fast the world seems to be changing recently and especially over the last 18 months and the number of different challenges. But... Just continuing with the same old, same old, with the same yeah. old people. <laughs> to think different, I think, is a, a slogan that has has been uh, can be repurposed. And actually, just, sorry, that's just a really cheesy link. Speaking of repurposing, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that. Um, 
we're jumping around in subjects here, but you've been talking a lot about and leading the way on refurb refurbishment and repurposing for, for some time. And uh, the, one of the post pandemic zeitgeists at the moment seems to be retro first, even in, my, in the bit of my life with working with contractors and demolition contractors in particular, we're seeing a lot of projects coming to market at the moment where buildings are being not just demolished, just now, now more complex cutting and carving because they have a carbon signature, not just yeah. because they have a presence. Uh, I, I presume you're very happy that this is, this is happening. What, what have been your key projects along the way? Uh, and do you get as much of a buzz out of them as building something new? And, and what, are you, what are the challenges? So this is, I mean, I was, I, I was watching, I, in fact, I went to the Charlotte Perriand exhibition at the Design Museum and she, um, a really sort of renowned French furniture designer who worked with Corbusier, and, and she was talking about, con, you know, welcoming constraints because they make a project richer. And, and, and I think that that's a little bit the case with existing buildings and that the, the, the constraint of the existing building is an, usually almost always ends up in something quite rich at the end of it if you just try and do you try and weave in a project around the repurposing of that thing and but it's also necessity and that I we I suppose our early projects in education for the studio were all in in state schools where they didn't have the funds to, to sort of think about just complete demolition and, and starting afresh, you know, that was, a, that was a sort of luxury that they didn't have. And it took a lot of creative thinking to, to, to convince a board of governors or, you know, the leadership in the school to say, look, just take another look at the assets that you've got here and, and don't feel that they're, they should be dismissed because they've been sort of trashed internally or externally over 20 years or 30 years of, of, of occupation you know, the basic frame and feel of the place is fine and that a classroom really hasn't changed much. It's it's usually about, you know, a sort of rectangle of about 50 square meters uh, with corridors down the middle and, and that there's value in those frames. So we, all the projects, in fact, in the early years were all around repurposing of these spaces sometimes at different degrees, sometimes quite or internalized, sometimes new skins and new windows to improve thermal performance, all different range. Um, and, and what that did coupled with, again, necessity, the almost, you know, they would get funds for the capital project, but then no funds for ongoing maintenance. So we thought, right, actually having, you know, done repurpose this building, we need to leave it in a way that it doesn't require any maintenance. So we came up with a sort of zero maintenance um, pursuit. Uh, and that really led to we hadn't realized we were sort of designing in a very pared back circular way because we thought you must be able to put it in and take it back out again without you know trashing the whole uh, installation uh, you have to be able to cope with a very tough user which are students usually um, and and not you know not have to constantly be painting so we tried to do schemes with no dry lining and no paint that that require this sort of cycle of, of improvement every year and and so that that sort of all those little um, common traits of, of the secondary school projects of, of low funds, you know, value in the assets that you've got there, you know, trying to pare back and make things easier, easier to maintain, gave us a real appreciation for repurposing stuff. Because out, out the end of it comes really, you know, what matters? They've got good daylight, they've got good, good places to learn, it's quiet, the air is fresh, you know, they can go out, but they've got a, a new door to the garden and they can go outside. It's quite simple stuff, really, that make a good project. And, and you can do that in an old building or, a, a, you know, a building that has a lease of life still just as easily as you can in a new one. You might just have different challenges. Uh, so that's, that's where we got into it and it's just great to think that the industry is finally recognizing this value as well on, on a much bigger scale and 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 also some of the great projects that are coming out of it but I it's not just buildings so we've even done this with bridges and it's trying to convince people to do the same you know repurpose a bridge and we did a very small scheme in Hounslow which was just a little link between a new school and a housing development which was tacked onto the side of a road bridge over um, London, London Underground Line and it was to it was convincing them because they all looked at it and thought it's just so awful. But the complications of replacing that bridge when it's over a live rail line, hugely complicated, hugely expensive, just and then it was like we can't do anything. Uh, so it was convincing this group and the London Borough of Hounslow that through colour and through small changes and through treatments of the ground plane and the integration of perforated panels in the wall 
of the, the enclosure, it's still a full enclosure, but perforated panels so kids can watch the trains go by from on the bridge. Those little things, I think we did the whole thing. Well, it was a super tight budget, didn't require any closure of anything, uh, and it completely transformed it. So you can repurpose all sorts of stuff if you if you just come at it from that from that lens. Uh, it was interesting listening to your answer there, because of course, actually, the, the big thing behind the Retro First campaign, headlines with carbon, and I don't think you said the C word in that answer at all. No. So... Do you think that the world needs to make major explicitly on carbon or is that, you know, in some ways, the things you've explained there, which is about a kind of respect for the, what's good in the, in the built environment already and, and being careful with money is, is enough? I think it's got to be everything because, you know, we've got such a challenge ahead of us. And, and you, I think it's about getting people to come with you emotionally. Uh, and, and for each individual to take a sense of responsibility around it and change their behaviors. Like we did the huge success with no longer using the plastic bags in the shops, you know, and I think, you know, people were just, of course, we'll change. And we've changed just like that. You know, they only have to charge 5p a bag or whatever it is. And then suddenly we're all behaving differently. And it's the trouble with only talking about carbon, of course, it's hugely important, but it's a little bit exclusive. You know, if you talk to the average you know, just you meet someone on the high street or in the supermarket and ask them what they're doing to reduce carbon. You know, they, it's, they can't have the same level of emotional sense of responsibility toward that or even an understanding. But if you say, what are you doing to help your child learn well in school? Or how are you saving funds at the, at the local community center so that you can replace the windows and, and, and you'll be warmer? And the, you know, it's things that, that, it's lots of things. Everything has to feed into it and it's not just one. And, and again, in the money, it's the money talks. So reducing carbon is less stuff and, and money saved. So all these, all the messages together, the big pie has to be filled across different things. And it has to talk to your um, personal, emotional sense of, of um, something's better. So all that interconnect interconnectedness. Totally. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Well, okay, final question then. Um, there's been a lot of thinking, evidently, you've talked around a lot of it behind the gradual evol evolution of the useful, simple family of practices. And, and I can see a lot of exploration still going on around the, thing, the things you do and the way you do it. Are you approaching a settled form? That kind of feel, <laughs> that feels like a sort of a question out of his dark materials. Do you have a settled form or are you going to continue to evolve, do you think? No, I mean, I'm definitely not settled. I don't think I'm a person that does settle. I, you can't, there's too much to do still. Uh, and too many problems to solve that I don't think we can afford to settle anywhere. And if anything, you know, people entering into a career path now, it must be quite um, unnerving because you, it's, you know, there are so many options and so many different ways to go. And I think a kind of understanding that you're not going to join a, a linear journey from start to finish, which remains the same. But it's, I think unsettled is the right way to be and that we need to keep chess just keep questioning, keep probing and, and welcome all the fresh thought from below and, and benefit from the le lessons learned from above uh, and get the whole sandwich working together. Well, that's, that sounds like a great place to leave it. We're, we're, all, we're, all never, yeah, we're all never the finished object seems to, be the, seems to be the message, which is a good one. I believe in that as well. Thanks for taking part today and talking to us. It's been a great conversation. Uh, the format for IABSI and Conversation comes from an idea by David Knight. IABSI is a group of designers and engineers that are passionate and inspired by the world around us. And to find out more, head to our website at iabsi.org.uk. And thank you for listening. Thank you.